At the dawn of the 17th century, in the age of heroic commerce and adventure, a colossal organization, the Dutch East India Company, better known as VOC, emerged, in the midst of Europe's 80-year war, defying the bounds of imagination and dwarfing all other enterprises in history. This legendary behemoth, whose reach extended to the farthest corners of the world, forged paths where none had dared, commanded the treacherous high seas, and weathered political intrigues. It was more than a mere trading company, it was a living, breathing force of ambition, innovation, and conquest that shaped the destinies of nations from the spice-scented bazaars of the East Indies to the bustling ports of Europe. But the greatness came at a cost, which left an indelible mark on the annals of history as its reign also bore witness to the clash of civilizations, the exploitation of resources, and the ebb and flow of power. Dear friends, join us on this captivating odyssey as we unlock the secrets of the largest company in history, with its whopping valuation of $7.9 trillion in today's inflation-adjusted terms, at the peak of euphoria, tulip mania, it created, in 1637. After getting rid of the tyrannical yoke of the Spanish Habsburg Empire, the Dutch opted for a merchant burger republic in which all seven rebel provinces united while retaining their distinctness, and except for the states general, where provincial states met at periodic intervals, the Republic of the United Netherlands had no central state institutions. Therefore, the nascent republic started to look for alternatives to king's ruling with God's favor. Consequently, legal and philosophical reflections arose. Humanist and Calvinist theologians found this in the Book of Nature as a true divine revelation that could be applied to everyone, everywhere, thinking that nature may unite God's creation in a republic with lots of even inter Christian religious diversity. Furthermore, intellectuals, such as Grotius, Court, Spinoza, and Mandeville, also shaped Dutch society according to how man in his natural state is, rather than how people should ideally be. These liberal and exploratory ideas were vehemently opposed by orthodox clergymen. But, the Dutch regents did a balancing act, and they landed on a healthy, natural drive with self-interest built in it, linking the natural instinct of open trade with it. Since the discovery of the Cape Sea route to the east, the Portuguese have painstakingly maintained a monopoly in the supply of lucrative spices from the east with strong control and secrecy. From the beginning, the Dutch were their active partners in sales, distribution, and financing. And for long, tales of untold riches from the remote East Indies captivated Dutch cities, particularly Amsterdam, a thriving and inspiring world of commerce and finance. Therefore, after unprecedented successes in the Eighty Year War, Dutch traders sought to test their abilities and thinking to rival the Portuguese, a weaker part of their enemy, the Spain Portugal Empire which joined together in 1580-1640 under the marriage alliance. In 1592, Linshoten, a young and ambitious traveller, after working as an assistant in Portuguese Goa, returned with invaluable, detailed knowledge of lucrative spice trade secrets in the East. He published his experiences and observations in the book Itinerario, revealing the closely guarded Portuguese routes, charts, and methods that sparked interest in Amsterdam. Further, another inspiring figure in Amsterdam, Petrus Plantius, a gifted cartographer and theologian, also collaborated with merchants, creating detailed maps and navigational charts. In 1594, a Dutch businessman, Cornelis de Houtman, returned from Lisbon with more information and formed a far-distance company with other merchants, raising capital to build and equip ships. He set sail to the east for spices with four ships from Amsterdam on April 2, 1595. The journey was long and arduous, and after months of sailing, the expedition reached the Cape. They continued eastward to the island of Madagascar, where they were forced to stay for six months due to widespread scurvy and other sea diseases and to resupply and rest, losing 71 men to sea sickness. Moving forward they sailed directly to the Sunda Strait through the Indian Ocean and reached the commercial port city of Bantam on the island of Java, smartly avoiding their competitor and military enemy, the Portuguese, who had a strong presence along the Indian and Malacca Straits. But, due to the Portuguese influence at Bantam, they failed to coordinate with the local ruler and moved to Madura and then to Bali, where they managed to procure some spices and sail back, reaching Texel on August 14, 1597 with only three ships and 87 out of 248 men on board. Even though the trip ended in disaster, the mission recovered the cost thanks to a sudden increase in demand due to a short supply of spices, 
enticing business people wealthy enough to finance these high-risk, speculative ventures. Amsterdam led the way, but merchants and investors from Middelburg, Veer, and Rotterdam also equipped vessels for the voyages. The Dutch rapidly surpassed the Portuguese and Europeans in Asia, with multiple Dutch trade companies sending 14 fleets comprised of 65 ships compared to the Portuguese's 59 ships by 1602 before the formation of the United Company for East. The Dutch in Asia were competing with one another due to the sudden and uncoordinated explosion of activities, which meant raising purchase prices in the East and lowering sales prices in the Netherlands. Therefore, to gain more control over the buying and selling of Asian products, the formation of a united trading company for the East in the Republic was envisioned. But the Dutch provinces were diverse and politically fragmented, each with its own interests, ambitions, competition, distrust, and, above all, dread of centralization and the supermacy threat of financially dominant Amsterdam. The intervention of the key statesman, Johan van Oldenbarnevelt, played a crucial role in pacifying and agreeing. The potential for immense profits, prosperity, and breaking free from Portuguese and Spanish dominance also served as a unifying force. Additionally, the formation of the new, competitive English East India Company in 1600 created tension, which also convinced others, including the influential Prince Maurice of Orange, the military and political leader of the Republic. Thus, after a lot of discussion and convincing, on March 20, 1602, the States General formed the United East India Company, by combining existing East Indies companies into the first joint start company of the world with a 21-year monopoly right to conduct trade, engage in war, imprison and kill convicts, negotiate peace and treaties, make their own coins, and set up colonies in the region to the east of the Cape of Good Hope. Anyone from the United Provinces could buy shares in the company, which were sold in open-air secondary markets, that eventually became the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. The company was given six chambers in Amsterdam, Zeeland, Rotterdam, Delft, Horn, and Enkhuizen. Amsterdam was not permitted to control more than half of the company's activities, including building and equipping ships, and trading in Asian products, for Zeeland, this was a quarter and for the other chambers, one sixteenth. However, this division did not reflect the division of the capital amassed as Amsterdam merchants and investors contributed more than half the new company's share capital. The VOC had 72 directors, with the Amsterdam Chamber having 20 directors, Zeeland having 12, and the other chambers each having 7. Each chamber selected a number of directors for the main board of the company, the Huron 17 or the Lord 17, which meets twice or thrice a year. Amsterdam sent 8 directors, Zeeland sent 4, and the other chambers each sent 1. Zeeland and the small chambers were each permitted, in turn, to send one extra representative to outweigh together the heavyweight Amsterdam, if required. The organization was different in comparison to modern companies, as its shareholders had no say in governance because politicians were entitled to appoint directors, not shareholders. Initially, these were the provincial states of the region where the chambers were located, but after a while, the city councils with a VOC chamber also gained the right of appointment. As a result, members of the city's regent families became directors of the company. VOC, a private commercial corporation that was to operate free from the direct control of the Dutch government, has the authority to make decisions in the name of the government. They could make treaties and declare war or peace in the name of the states general, construct forts and arm them with cannons, hire troops, establish colonies, dispense justice, enact laws, and even issue their own currency the VOC would essentially operate as a state within a state. Initially, it forged its way around Africa and proceeded to battle the Portuguese for control of the spice trade. It had its own military force, which was important for trading in adverse conditions. It appeared to be more of a syndicate for piracy than a capitalist trading company, targeting the Portuguese power in Asia and controlled by government interests but receiving funding from investors rather than taxpayers. The inter-Asian trade has been thriving in the Indian Ocean for a long time, particularly along the sea coasts of major spheres of influence, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, China and Japan, and the Malaccas. In these regions, there were important commercial and exchange hubs, serving as emporiums of goods at each intersection point, including Ormuz, Surat, Calicut, and Malacca. 
these hubs exchanged goods and not only facilitated inter-Asian trades but also governed businesses for the nearby coast and their hinterland. After the opening of a direct sea route from Europe to Asia via the Cape in 1498, the Portuguese gradually ousted Muslim merchants and dominated the inter-Asian and intercontinental Europe trade in the absence of any intercontinental maritime power. And, by the end of the 16th century, they had captured the Indian subcontinent's majority maritime trade, and established themselves as the dominant sea power in the Persian Gulf, China Sea, and Moluccas, along with their senior partner Spain in the Philippines. Breaking this Portuguese monopoly was not easy for the new entrant, the Dutch. Further, there were new troubles. The English, who were not only competitors in European trade, but also dispatching fleets of their East India Company with a long-term interest in the spice trade of the East. Nevertheless, by the mid-17th century, with some of its maverick leaders like Jan Pietersoon Cohen and others, the Dutch had emerged as a dominant power in the East Indies, including India, by skillfully navigating a combination of military conquests, strategic alliances, and economic prowess. They overcame the Portuguese through a series of successful military campaigns, seizing key trading posts and fortifications in Southeast Asia, India, and Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Additionally, they employed astute diplomatic efforts, signing treaties that recognized their control over Portuguese-held territories and neutralized potential threats, such as the English. Simultaneously, the Dutch East India Company, VOC, established a highly profitable trading network effectively monopolizing the spice trade and other valuable commodities. This economic strength and territorial control made the Dutch a formidable force in the East Indies, enabling them to emerge as a dominant European power in the region by the mid-17th century.